A very good morning and happy Sabbath. Just to give you the context of what the passage that I will be uh, sharing with you, um, when pastor asked whether I could preach, I thought, yes, I can. But then I asked him, what passage should I uh, be uh, preaching from? He said, well, it's the speaker's choice. So um, in my morning readings, I'm reading as Isaiah. And um, it just dawned upon me that um, for those of you who know me, um, my work that I do currently right now, I lead a team called Care Singapore. And I've been very blessed because uh, we have many board members at Care Singapore from this congregation. Thank you very much for your belief and support. And while I was going through um, the morning readings, I thought that um, it might be important to bring forth the understanding of God, theology, make it practical to how it applies. And so, it's a short, not even a passage, probably a few verses that I'll be taking. Looking at it and applying it, the subtitle says, Finding Belonging and Purpose in God, right? But why is it so important in the middle of the um, sermon to share with you the impact when a person or individual does not have belonging or purpose, what may happen? And to bring it back then for us as believers of God, faith um, warriors even, how can we then apply it in our lives? All right, so this is the way I hope <laughs> that we can journey through. So in Isaiah 43, um, as we have seen in the scripture reading, highlighting some parts of it, and right in that passage, that verse, something stands out very, very strongly. It says here, fear not for, right? And it gives the reasons. But if you have time and you look at the book of Isaiah, you realize what was prophet trying to tell the people? What was the context of it all? In fact, if you read the whole book of Isaiah, all 66 uh, but, uh, past, um, chapters, you're going to find that it's, it can be divided into two main points or two main parts. One that goes all the way from chapter 1 through chapter 39, and then the other from 40 onwards. Now, the context is this. It's written, Isaiah was called sometime around 740 BC, and um, just about two decades before the northern kingdom of Israel was going to fall to Assyria. So can you imagine, the first 39 chapters of Isaiah was a lot of judgment. This is going to come because you didn't do this. This is going to happen. It strikes the people with fear and all that. But Isaiah was called boldly to bring this message. But in the middle of it, right, then comes chapter 43. And then it begins the whole idea of fear not. In the midst of all that is going to happen, terrible things, the northern kingdom will be destroyed, never to return. Captives will be taken away by Assyria, a very, very cruel nation. And yet, Isaiah's message was presented not only to the northern kingdom, but to the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, we look back the chapter, and we know what happened because the southern kingdom also fell. They did not heed the words of this prophet. Now, if you were to do a performance management on prophet Isaiah, then he failed. 
his message was not taken. So we have that blessing of hindsight and to turn that into wisdom from hindsight is to look at the book and see where the people of Israel did not take heed, we should and must take heed. And so I thought it good that we're focusing on a few verses, right? It's not the whole exposition of Isaiah. But Isaiah 43, right there, God declares, fear not. And these are the reasons why we should not fear. Number one, I've redeemed you. Now, this is a very tough message to receive just before you're told you are all going to be destroyed. If you don't follow through, you're going to be destroyed. But yet, God says, fear not, for I have redeemed you. Right? And he goes a bit personal. I've called you by name. Now, we all know that names are really, really important to us. Right? And you really appreciate it when someone addresses you by name. Right? And that is so important because it has that personal touch. Now, you may not be able to see it, but it has two big words here. When I call you by name, when I address you by name, it shows that I have a relationship with you or I want to have a relationship with you and I want to have that connection with you. So important. And so God gets personal with us. He tells us, hey, I've redeemed you. I've called you by name. Every single one of us here and all those listening in, God has called you by your name. Now, of course, I know there are some people, maybe they may not like their names, right? But then you may want to change it. Then after changing it, we call you by that name. I remember uh, my name is John, if you, in case you do not know. Uh, wasn't given, I mean, I didn't give myself that name. It was my grandmother. And uh, so one day I looked up and tried to find out why did my grandmother give me the name John. And you must know the context of it. Um, she's a Buddhist, right? And along the way, my life story is that, okay, my grandmother, she passed away as a Buddhist. But my parents, my father followed the mother very faithfully as a Buddhist, but then later he converted to Christianity. And so did my mom. But very interestingly, or almost prophetic, I tried to uh, look up the meaning of the name John. Now, John has been used in many, many ways, right? Uh, one of the most interesting ways it's been used is that um, it, uh, it's a name that you call a very important place. You know what place? Yeah. yeah. John Hover, no, yeah. We always joke about it. The Johns, yes. So I looked it up and I saw, my goodness, it means the gift of God. So way back then, my grandmother, who named me John, right, decided that somehow, prophetically, even as a Buddhist, she thought it has to do something about gift of God. And I always remind Adeline, right, I, I tell her, you know, careful, my name John, huh? gift of God to you, you know, wow. Well, you may look at the name, you may, you may address it, you may not like it. But truth be told is that God has called you by your name. Can you turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor that God has called you by your name? There is a reason you are here. There is a reason you are listening. There is a reason God has called you. And even the next words is fantastic because it's not only has God called you by your name, He declares, you are mine. We belong to God. 
Prophet Isaiah was given that responsibility to go to a group of people even though God knew that this group would be stubborn and would not listen to him. As a result, northern kingdom fell. The southern kingdom fell to Babylon and for 70 years was in exile. But this prophecy stayed on, stayed on. They were redeemed. They were called by name. They were gods, but they did not believe or act out as though they belonged to God. What is this belongingness about? Well, a few things. Number one, it's the gift of God. We did nothing to earn it because God declares it. All of us here, we belong to God and that's it. Nothing we can do to earn it. God gave it to us. We are God's. Number two, we've been bought with a price. It's a very expensive price. It costs the life of our Savior. He paid the price for our lives, for our sins. So we are God's because He has bought us with a price. He has redeemed us. And for us, then, it should be a kind of antidote to fear because then we have nothing to fear because God is on our side. Regardless of what we are facing, we have nothing to fear. And He gives us also a sense of identity, right? We derive it from God's love, but nothing on our side that we can do to earn it. We have already got it. No need to work hard for it. We have already gotten it. And so we are God's. That belongingness reminds us then as we go forward, right? With courage. Now, very interestingly, also in the same passage, chapter 43, again, I've chosen it because of uh, what God has declared to His people. Now that God has called you by name, now that we are God's, He says, you are my witnesses. Right? Says the Lord. We are His witnesses. And what does that mean? You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am He. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. Interestingly, now that we belong to God, He depends on us as we serve Him, right, to make Him known. Right? But before that, it's about us knowing Him and believing Him and understand that God is God. So we are His witnesses. So we belong to God and we are His witnesses. Now, I thought a few New Testament passages to kind of reflect this understanding or concept that God has given us to be and to act for Him. In Acts chapter 1, interestingly, and this is from the, the words of uh, Christ, it says, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So it seems that while we are God's, then He has called us also to be His witnesses. And in this case, in Acts in the formation of the new church, right? It's about going out to the whole world that we are God's witnesses to testify about God's love. In Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, might be a familiar one, but I've chosen it just to kind of reflect this. And he says that we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that we may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Again, a proclamation witnesses that God has called us from darkness onto marvelous light. That's our job. That's what we're supposed to do. And once more, Ephesians chapter 2 says this, 
for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We have been created, prepared beforehand, right, for good works. Not that the good works save us. No, it's the other way around. God has chosen us. God has called you my name. God has asked us to be his witnesses. And we are supposed to do good works that he has prepared for us. So if you see this whole, you know, calling that God has given us, we have something to do for God, right? And it is about purpose. So firstly, first part is about belongingness. Second part is about purpose. We are God's witnesses, bearing testimony of God's being, character, and purpose. We are holy and special, chosen to proclaim the praises of God who has caught out us of darkness. We are empowered because His Spirit empowers us to bear witness to the whole world and we are His workmanship. Now, why am I... This is like reminders. It's not something new, right, for most of us. Why am I, remind, why am I talking about this? Well, it delves on the point of the fact that we belong to God Right? So we derive our identity, we derive our purpose from that. At the same time, we have a purpose. We have something to do here on earth. The fact that we are still alive shows we still got something to do for God. Now, why am I bringing this up? Because what if we don't feel belong? And what if we have no purpose? If we feel, hmm... There's no point for us to be around. And this is where I felt that in my own reflection, the connection to the kind of work that I do currently and helping other people to do at the same time. And um, it is about saving lives, firstly, about helping people you know, find themselves, find meaning in their lives to carry on. Yes, no doubt it is in a secular space. But we see from our work, we see lots of desperate lives. We see people to the point where nothing works out for them. We see people so hurt and bruised that they are just looking for healing, but they just can't find it. And so as I was reflecting it, deeper than about belongingness and purpose. It struck me in the line of work that I do, particularly right now, also in suicide prevention, there is a long-standing theory about 20 plus years by a psychologist called Dr. Joyner. And he proclaims this, that there are three main reasons why people might be thinking of ending their lives. And as I was looking at this theory and application of this theory, and I realized, my goodness, I can't help but think about Isaiah's message to us. Isaiah's proclaiming God's word to us. I can't help but see the parallel. Why? Because it states this, that when some people don't feel any connection at all to others, and when they feel life has no purpose because they are a burden to others, and when they then acquire the capability to end their lives, chances are then dying by suicide is very, very high. Now you know... Um, over the pulpit, I have talked about suicide prevention, you know, sometimes. But in this context, I just cannot help but hear and see the parallels in the words of Isaiah. Why? Because, number one, when these people at risk, right, lose connection, they, they don't find any, and, and they feel they are totally isolated and disconnected, chances are for them to think about dying 
increases. In the same way, when they feel that they are a burden, there's no point for them to be around, it also increases. But the third point is the clincher. The third point says that when someone has the ability to engage, for example, in a suicide behavior, because they have acquired all right, or experienced very negative or painful or traumatic life experiences so that the fear of death becomes a very natural and powerful instinct, which is opposite of how God designs us to be, that life is precious, that life is meaningful, but these people somehow acquire that, hmm, it's better that they go away. And so there are some groups of people more affected than others. For example, it could be because of the exposure to the work they do. It could be because they are in the military. Or it could be because they are in the police force. It could be all of that. Why? Because they may see death on a regular basis. They become desensitized. As a result of becoming desensitized, they may not right, have this kind of protective or default mode of life preservation. And that's quite scary. And so it states then that if this group of people do not have a sense of belonging or purpose, their risk increases. This uh, couple of weeks, I had the privilege of just um, presenting some um, suicide prevention training workshops with um, officers from the police force. Um, I did a couple of runs with them. Um, they were just whole day trainings and, and just got to know some of the police officers. I do this on an on a annual basis as part of the work at CARE. And got to know these police officers, because some of them are very experienced because they have seen death so many times, they become desensitized. And when they become desensitized, if they don't have a sense of belonging, like family or friends, or just some good community support, and if they don't feel any sense of purpose in their lives, it is quite an easy way for them to think about suicide. And that's the scary part. Now, well, I don't think most of us in the congregation belong to the police force or maybe military, right? So we may not think that we'll be affected in that sense. Now, the theory then goes on to say that there is another group of people who might be also affected, not necessarily because of their occupation, but it could be because in the past they've had received abuse. They had suffered pain so unbearable that then death becomes almost like a welcome friend. And these are the people that of, is of concern. They are of concern because particularly if they don't have any sense of belonging or connection, or if they don't see any purpose, the risk increases. So I was reflecting on this from the point of view that Isaiah carrying the message of God even to the people of Israel, but then now we looking back at the passages and applying it in our lives today, what does it mean for us? What does it mean for us? A sense of belonging and purpose. And I just want to share with you that this is somehow very feeling-based because some of us may have gone through journeying with as a Christian for some time, but then we don't feel that connection anymore. It's that feeling kind of thing. And often it resides in our emotions because if then we feel disconnected, right? It could be that. And if you look at statistics and you realize quite a number of people 
may be leaving church because they just don't feel the connection. Quite a number of youth and young adults typically would leave church because they no longer see that kind of connection. Nor are they thinking about the purpose for which God has called them to carry out. So, if they don't have that kind of connection, and if they don't find any other connection, then it might be an issue. So, looking from the words of Isaiah, then it's about having God's antidote for us, right? Particularly if you yourself right now may be thinking that, oh, I don't feel it anymore. I just want you to know this is the kind of like the recipe for the antidote and it says this we belong to him we belong to god he has called us for a purpose and we really matter most times we feel that hey you know what i don't i don't feel i make any difference i must well go away but god is telling us no through isaiah he says no we really matter to Him, right? And so, there should be some joy in us saying, look, we have been redeemed, and there should be some confidence in our identity and purpose. And, well, despite all that we are going through, there's peace in uncertainty. We should have all of that, right? We should. So, Acknowledging that sometimes the shoot and the wood sometimes don't happen, right? So this is part where I think the practicality part comes in. And this is, we are reminded of in the second verse of uh, 43, Isaiah 43. It says this, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flames scorch you. Now, this is a fantastic promise, all right? It comes after God says, you are mine. It comes after God says, you are called by your name. We are God's. Fear not. Why? Because God will be with us. Now, here's the catch. The catch is this. God does not promise that we won't go through deep waters, rivers of difficulty or fires of oppression. Now, sometimes we may pray about it. We may pray that God, you know, we don't want this, we don't want that. But God did not promise that. God did not promise that. Sometimes it is our own doing. Sometimes it's not even our own doing that we may be struck by maybe unfortunate stuff. Well, God did not promise that those things won't happen. Instead, He says, He will be with us through it all. Yes, we may experience that kind of pain, but He will see us through. And this sometimes comes from a feeling, but I would like to present to you then that it is a fact. It is a biblical fact. It is a spiritual fact right? That God will be with us. In fact, throughout our history of men, God has always declared, I will be with you. I want to be with you. In fact, the name, God's, one of God's name, Emmanuel, God with us. He has always longed to be with us. And what does it mean then for us? Regardless of what you're going through, I do not know what you're going through right now. As you have come into this century, maybe you have some worries and some troubles. I just want you to claim, to be able to claim that. Now, the context of Isaiah, if you look back, if you look back in history, it was a terrible time. Because after Isaiah proclaimed it, one by one, it came through. There were wars. They were, you know, the whole destruction of the nation. They were taken away. They were exiled. Many, many years of tough times. And yet, God's word prevailed throughout. That was like 
2,000, almost 3,000 years ago. And God words, God's word still prevails. And that is God wants to be with us. Now, we may not feel it, but I'm just sharing with you, it is a fact. So, just in ending then, three main practical areas for us to be thinking about. All right? And that is number one. It starts off with a foundation of faith. And faith comes from hearing the Word of God and reading the Word of God. So I'm going to challenge you. What is your foundation? What, what are you reading? Right? As a start. As a start. For example, even understanding and taking Isaiah as a start. It's like saying, God, you are telling me I'm yours. What does that mean? Right? I may not feel it now, but it's a fact. And the Word has prevailed for so many years through all the troubles that, you know, His people have gone through. It is a fact. Building a foundation on God's Word. So to challenge you, what are you reading? Number two, focus on what matters. Now, most times, sometimes, when we go through all these issues and problems, it's always about ourselves, right? Ourselves is that because we are in pain and we'll be wondering, why oh, God, why do you allow this? Why do you allow this? My word to you will be, why not? Why not? Again, go back to that foundation of faith. Go back to that foundation of promise that God says, I will be with you. You are mine. I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. Once again that. And then suddenly, now I will challenge you to start thinking, focus on eternal perspectives instead of dwelling on ourselves. It's not about you. It is about you, but it's not about you, you. As you go through it, can you hear God's voice telling you, I am with you. God did not promise that you won't go through that, but God did promise He will go through that with us. And so, can we switch that perspective to not ourselves alone, but to eternal ones. The third thing then, kind of linked to like the first one is, what are you feeding on? And I'm not talking about your physical food, but I'm talking about your spiritual food. What are you feeding on? Are you, building, are you feeding on that which strengthens your faith? Or are you feeding on that which weakens your faith? What are you watching? What are you absorbing? What are you hearing to? Who are you hanging out with? These are just very basic, basic questions. Now, if I may draw back them saying that moving from spiritual fact to a spiritual experience of feeling God's presence requires some work for us to do. And that is feeding on God's Word focusing on what matters and really building up your faith. Now, the whole book of Isaiah, it's a very theological, dense book. It's very heavy. Yet, if we compare what the Israelites or the people of God went through, even after having the words of Isaiah, they did not follow they did not follow. I want to just um, put forth this challenge to all of us here today right now, and that is, regardless of what you are going through right now, if God has already called you by your name, and God declares that He wants to be with us, are you up for the challenge of accepting Him? to the Word, His Word, and saying, yes, God. And if you are not, I just want to tell you, try Him. Try. 
coming just from my very humble perspective of being very blessed in having um, that privilege of studying God's Word in seminary and now practicing so-called practical theology in meeting the needs of desperate people I'm just saying that part of my work constraint is that I'm not able to very openly talk about God gospel and all that in some of the settings but in seeing the intersection of pain and emotion and brokenness I pray for them silently in my heart but then I do share with them then that you do not need to be alone at least because there are caring people who will attend to them but more so for me it opens up the possibility of just touching them with God's love. If you really get to know what God intends for you, what the Creator intends for all of us, what God wants to journey with you, preparing heaven, preparing eternity for us. If you just can see that, then whatever we are going through right now is only temporary. And as we respond now, inviting Jeff and Nisi back to remind us, as we go through then, it is about our soul that God wants to reach and touch. It is indeed well with our soul when we give forth ourselves to Him. And remember, he has already called you by your name. You are God's. And don't ever forget that. May God bless you all.